everyone. How are you doing today? Welcome back to Computer Science 4300. I had the wrong title up there on the uh, intro screen for a minute. Hope everyone is doing well. Uh, what are we doing today? Today we are looking at game loops. Let me update this. So advanced main game loops. There we go. So we've looked at game loops already. We've had a very, very um, simplified version of game loops, just the main loop that runs all of our code. And we're going to look at today how we could improve those for specific functionality that we might want in our game engine. So let's hop right into it. <clears throat> I'm a little out of breath. I was just chasing a ferret around right before the, the lecture started. She was digging into a box of carrots and uh, I had to get her to stop that because it was very noisy. All right. So advanced game main loops. Just to let you know that um, some of the material for these slides is actually available in the optional textbook for the course called Game Programming Patterns. And so you can go to this URL to uh, read more about this if you want. So in the beginning, you may recall, um, before we made games, we made little console programs, right? And uh, so recall your console programs that you wrote while learning how to program, maybe back in first year or second year. And those console programs probably looked something like this. So you run some initial code, maybe set up some variables, uh, print some instructions from the user to the screen, and then wait for input for the user somehow. Once the user inputs some sort of data, you store that user input, and then you continue with the program code. So for example, um, uh, I taught uh, computer science 1510 once, which was a C and Fortran programming course. And this was one of the first things we ever did was something like this. So you have, uh, you set up some initial variables, right? So we have input here. Um, and then while true, you have uh, enter the distance in feet. And then the user puts in some sort of input, maybe, um, you know, uh, two feet or something like that, and then you print out that is input times 12 inches, right? Very, very simple stuff. But the important thing here is that um, this is a blocking call. Right here, when you say C in input, that goes from standard. I know I'm not putting standard here, but I had to fit it on the line. But this waits for the user to input something. So this is what this program structure sort of looks like. Display some instructions, run some initial code, and then while true, wait for some user input that is blocking, meaning the program does not progress without your user input. Then do something interesting with that input and then display more instructions or maybe quit the program. All right, so that is the very basic, simple program structure that you've been using. But then we moved on to graphical user interfaces. So something like you may have done in another course or in this course, we're using SFML to display games. And that is a, 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 a GUI. So more modern GUIs follow the same basic structure um, since nothing in the GUI changes unless the input values, okay? Um, unless the user inputs some values. So for example, we may have like a word processor. Now I understand that very modern word processors work differently than this. They're probably super multi-threaded and things going on all over the place. But let's think of a user interface like a word processor, which also work with blocking input, right? So for example, you're displaying the current document and you're really waiting for the user to either type something or click something. And then you handle the user input somehow and then you repeat. So this would be very similar to what we just did. So it would be display the initial GUI screen, then while true, we're gonna pull the user for some events. Maybe we're gonna wait for them to, um, we're not actually saying, you know, please enter feet in inches, but we're just waiting for them to push a button because nothing on the screen is going to change unless the user actually inputs something like starts typing in the document. Um, and then based on their input, we're gonna update some internal variables based on that. So, you know, they type some input, so there's new input on the screen. And then we update the user interface based on what they put in. So we don't need to worry about like frames per second or anything like that when we're talking about a very simple text editor because the, the thing only has to update when the user inputs some data. 
So at first we had the console input blocking, and then this is also input blocking, even though it's a, it's a GUI, but it's because the type of GUI is very simple and doesn't need to be redrawn unless we're actually putting in new, new data. Now, of course, if you want something like a blinking cursor, then you can't do this, right? You'd need to be drawing every frame in order to implement the blinking cursor. But again, this is a very basic example. But unlike other programs like that, games keep moving even when the user doesn't input, right? So the game won't be paused just because the user isn't doing anything. Um, the clocks keep ticking, the NPCs keep running at you, maybe, you know, they're shooting at you, animation keeps animating. And so the key here is that in our game engine, we are not waiting for the user input, right? If the user inputs something, we'll do something with that input, but we are not waiting for it. It's not a blocking call, as we would say in, in uh, software engineering. So here's what happens here. Um, we're going to display our initial GUI. We are going to process user input if any exists. So we are no longer waiting for input. We are just processing it if it exists. Then we update our internal game simulation by one step and we render the current game screen, right? So in our engine, it looks something like this. It's process input, meaning if there is input, do something with it update the simulation of the game, and then render the game. And so we've got something else here, which is going to come into play later, which is, and as some people have, have asked me throughout the term, um, yes, our game simulation is tied to the rendering, right? So we've got one simulation step and then one render step, and they are locked to each other. You cannot decouple them in our current game engine. And if you look at assignment four, this is pretty much what that looks like, right? So we've taken these three basic steps and the update here is actually all of our systems, right? So we're gonna process user input, we update our entity manager, then we call all our systems and then we call our rendering. So that's, that's what we've been doing. Even though it doesn't look quite like this, it, this is the exact system that we've been implementing so far. Um, now, I know I have a bunch of uh, text on these slides. I apologize. I don't usually like putting a bunch of text, but I want, again, you don't need to have a textbook for the course, so I just have a bunch of text here so that when you refer to the PDFs, you can, you can read it um, rather than having to watch the video. So, game loop speed. Let's talk about that now. When programs use blocking input, they can run the main loop at any speed since it's limited by user input speed. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, if this was blocking input, then it wouldn't matter how fast this while loop ran because we're waiting maybe several seconds or minutes for user input, right? So we don't need to worry out about speed whatsoever since the input speed of the user is the blocking factor. It's literally stopping our computation. With non-blocking input in a game loop, we now need to decide how fast the main loop spins, right? So here in this, um, if this is not blocking, well, how fast do we do this, right? So uh, you know what I'm getting to. This is like the frames per second that your game is going to run. So each update is going to advance the game world simulation by the same amount on each call. So for example, if we have uh, Mario running around at speed five, then we're gonna add five to the speed. And every single time we call the update, that's gonna be the same, essentially. And so we can think of this as the game world clock. It's going to tick forward by one. And so the player's real world clock ticks at a different speed. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, we've got our game simulation. So for example, Mega Man or, or Zelda or whatever has their idea of like how fast the game is moving, but the player in the real world, their clock may be ticking at a different speed than that. So for example, we may have some like slow motion effects or maybe, you know, the, the in-game character is much faster than a human would be in real life. The difference here being that we have to somehow um, 
marry the ideas of the user in the real world, like us playing the game. We are advancing through the universe at some speed. And that has to be reasonable with respect to how the game world advances, right? So um, how many game loop cycles in one second determines the game's frame per second count, right? So what did I mean by all that? Well, for example, if if our code is so fast that this runs a thousand times per second, well, then we're going to have to make our game update. Maybe we can't update five pixels per frame if we're running at a thousand frames per second, because Mario would be on one side of the screen at, on one second, and they'd be off the screen like in the next second, right? So we've got to make this something reasonable to match sort of the, the, the human traveling through real universe time. Um, you know what I'm trying to say, right? We can't have it run too fast and we can't have it run too slow. Um, so if this ran at 60 loops per second, that would be 60 render calls, which is 60 frames per second. Right. And now, yes, I understand that these two things don't have to be coupled. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, but how would we accomplish, for example, if we determined that we wanted our game to be rendered at 60 frames per second, how could we actually accomplish that without some magic function that our um, graphics library gave us? So graphically speaking, like when you're actually playing a game, more frames per second, more render calls per second is smoother gameplay right? If you've ever seen a game running at 60 frames per second versus like 10 frames per second, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Like look at an old game on PS1 or something like that versus a, a modern game running at 240 hertz on a, on a high refresh rate monitor and you'll, and, you'll, and you'll know. So graphically, more frames per second is smoother play. Frames per second is t typically determined by two things. Um, one, how much work is being done on each loop, right? So for example, are we doing lots of crazy physics? Well, that may limit the frames per second that we can do. Um, also, how fast is the underlying hardware? So, you know, okay, if I do the same amount of work, but on really old hardware, maybe I can't keep up with the frames per second. If we talk back in the day about older consoles, um, well, I guess all consoles have this advantage, but older games especially had the advantage of knowing the exact hardware it was going to be run on. Like if I'm making um, Super Mario Brothers, right, for the NES, I know it's going to be running on an NES. So they knew exactly how fast the game would run because it's only ever one running on one CPU. It'll never change. But modern computers must run on a variety of hardware, right? So if you make your game for if you make your, your project for this course and you know you run it on maybe a lab machine on campus versus your laptop versus your gaming desktop at home, ideally it's going to run at the same speed no matter which hardware you're running it on. So how can we accomplish that? Oh, one second. My animation's rough. Okay, so the flexibility that you have with your game loop depends on a bunch of factors. One, the operating system. For example, how often can you pull events, right? It doesn't matter if we're running at 60 frames per second if you can only input one action per second, right? Now, modern hardware, we don't really need to worry about that, but back in the day, we, we maybe did. Um, in the operating system, are hardware events input blocking? or hardware input events blocking, can we maybe not progress unless we have that? Again, more modern hardware, we don't need to worry about that. Monitor, maybe our monitor can't actually render more than 60 refreshes per second, right? So it would be foolish to actually try and update the game at 120 frames per second if our monitor can only display 60. Maybe we've implemented some sort of networking, right? So the type of network traffic can determine like timeouts, packet loss, a bunch of different stuff that can affect how fast we want to update the game, but we're not covering networking in this course because that's an entire course in itself. So let's say we have decided, we've looked at our operating system, we've looked at the range of hardware, we've printed on the box, you must have at minimum Pentium 2 with two megabytes of RAM, right? 
and we say, okay, now we want the game, we want to run it at 60 frames per second. So we want to limit it to 60 frames per second. So far in the course, we've cheated because we just let SFML do this, right? So SFML has a built-in command, which says set frame limit 60. Now, keep in mind that this is a frame limit. It doesn't say set frames per second. It says set frame limit, and we'll get into that in a second. To do this manually, if, if we don't have a function which does this for us, we must manually limit our game. Uh, oh, that's a typo. I'm going to fix that now. Not out game. To do it manually, we must limit our game loop to run at most 60 times per second. So if we have a thousand milliseconds in a second, then a thousand divided by 60 is approximately 16 milliseconds. Okay. So what we're going to do is add a delay to the end of each main loop to accomplish this. So here's what happens. We're going to do our game loop. So we process our input, if any exists, we update our game, we render, and then we wait. So for example, let's say that um, this process took uh, 10 milliseconds. Hopefully it takes a lot less than that, but let's say it took 10 milliseconds. If we want to set the frame limit, well, let's just say 10 milliseconds. If every time this happens, it takes 10 milliseconds, then we would be running at 100 frames per second, right? It's very unlikely that in practice, this will take the same amount of time each time. Sometimes we might have more entities on the, on the, on the screen, etc. The physics might take longer to calculate. But if it took 10 milliseconds, then we would be running at 100 frames per second. But we want to run it at 60 frames per second, which is 16 milliseconds, right? So what we would do here is we would take our 16, we would subtract 10 from that, and we would be left with six milliseconds to wait at the end of our game loop. And then each game loop is running at 16 milliseconds. Now it's not exactly 16, it's like 16.333 or something like that. But that's how we would accomplish this. And this is exactly what's happening inside SFML. So we're going to determine the number of milliseconds per frame that we want. And so this might be 16, right? So if we have 60 frames per second, this is uh, 16. And if you run your loop, so we're gonna have uh, some starting time. And what we can say is get the current time in milliseconds or microseconds or something like that. So we have the starting time of our frame. Then we process the input. We update our game engine uh, simulation. We render. And then we say, okay, um, how much time did all of that take? So we get the current time in milliseconds. Then we subtract that from our starting time. And then we sleep a maximum amount of milliseconds per frame minus elapsed. So why max? Well, because we might get a negative number here. We can't sleep for a negative number. So that's a very basic way of setting a fixed frames per second in your game. So adding the sleep of the end of the loop ensures that we don't update too quickly. Now, sleep is not the only way of accomplishing this, but it's the only way that I want to describe in this course. We're not going down really low level hardware interrupt, hot sleep versus passive sleep kind of stuff, but you just put some sort of delay in there, okay, essentially. Um, unfortunately though, there's no way to ensure that slow code doesn't make your game run too slowly. So we can ensure that our game doesn't render too quickly, but we can never ensure that our game doesn't run too slowly. In this case, we must cut some computation time somehow to ensure that the FPS target can be reached. So we just had this, right? So we have the start, we recorded the starting time, we did some stuff, and then we record the end time. But let's say Sometimes, if we have a ton of stuff on the screen, if you've ever encountered lag in a game, which I'm sure you have, that's because there was too much stuff to do, right? So maybe it took us 20 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds to calculate that update frame. That could be too, too slow. Or maybe there was too much stuff on the screen and the render took too long, right? And so sometimes this is just going to take too long. Now, 
ideally, we have designed our game and our algorithms such that this stuff only takes like one or two milliseconds. So if there is a frame where there's twice as much stuff on the screen, now it's only taking like three or four milliseconds to compute rather than going from 10 to 20. But it can happen, right? Unexpectedly, the user might find some way to like, I don't know, spawn infinite things in your game or mess around with your game engine. And so you might want to have some sort of backup if something like this actually starts to happen. So in SFML, um, we have this set frame limit and it limits the frame limit in the maximum to a maximum. So this is the exact text that the SFML library uses to, to describe what it does. And I want to read this out because it's exactly what we just talked about. If a limit is set, the window will use a small delay after each call to display to ensure that the current frame lasted long enough to match the frame limit. SFML will try to match the given limit as much as it can, but since it internally uses SF sleep, whose precision depends on the underlying operating system, the results may be a little unprecise as well. So for example, you may get plus or minus 10% on your frame limit. So that's just a, a note on SFML. So that's how we can just set a frame limit. But I talked about that problem of what if things lag a little bit, right? How might we want to like catch up? So quick notes on the remaining slides in this lecture. So the following slides are going to show us how we could possibly implement like catching up with the game engine after a certain amount of maybe lag frames and lag frames were caused by too much computation on specific frames. Just keep in mind that in some cases you may want to do this and in other cases you don't want to do this, right? So for example, um, if your game lagged for like a second for two frames, then what you may want to do is on the next frame, you show what the user should have been shown if there was no lag two seconds in the future. Or maybe you just want those two lag frames to happen and then the user will start up like just, just say, okay, that was lag, right? So if you want lag, like for example, Right now, the way this is implemented, if this update takes one second, then that frame will just be displayed on the screen for one second. And then when the user starts playing again on the next second, well, they'll be just one frame advanced in the game simulation. What I'm trying to explain now is that the rest of the slides are saying, if, this, if normally this takes one millisecond, but this took one second, how can we catch up our game world to match where it should be now if no lag had occurred? Okay, sometimes you want to do that, sometimes you don't want to do that. If you don't want to do that, then this is what you use, this code right here. But if you do want to do that, let's discuss how you could do that. And again, these slides are just going to show you one way, actually two different ways to implement this technique if, in, if this is your goal in your game engine. Okay. If it's not your goal, just use the old code. But if you do want this sort of like catching up with lag, then we'll show you how. One way, it's not the preferred way, but well, I'm not going to say it's not the preferred way. It might be the preferred way if you want to use this. It's called game simulation scaling. So the problem we face is follows. Each update that we call advances the game time by some amount. And it takes some real amount of time to compute that, right? So if two takes longer than one, then the game slows down. So if it takes more real universe time to compute the update of the in-game time, then it's going to slow down, right? So let's say that we're trying, we've matched 60 FPS from the real world to the game. So one sixteen milliseconds in the real world is like one sixteen milliseconds in the in the game world, but if it took us a hundred milliseconds to compute that sixteen milliseconds of the game, then the game is going to seem like it's slowing down. So if it took longer than sixteen milliseconds to update the game world by its sixteen millisecond equivalent, then we can't keep up with this computation. But 
if we could advance the game world by more than 16 milliseconds, then we could update less frequently and keep up to date. So what we're going to do is we're going to introduce a variable that we will use to update the game world simulation. So that's a variable time step. And what we can do is say something like, well, if my last frame of computation took 50 milliseconds, well, on the next time I compute that, I'm going to update the game world by 50 milliseconds. Okay, so instead of just calling update, which updates the game world by a fixed amount, what we're going to do is we're going to record what I just said. So we're going to record how long the previous frame took to compute, and then we're going to update the game world based on that. So this is actually really interesting because what it does is we no longer have to do this sort of sleep thing, right? We can just let this game loop run as fast as it wants because if the game, if this loop took one millisecond to compute on the last frame, well, it's going to update the game engine by one millisecond of game world equivalent time, right? So Mario or whoever is not going to move very far. But if it took 50 milliseconds to update, then Mario is going to move 50 milliseconds equivalent in game world time. So in one update, Mario may have only moved two pixels, but in the next 50 millisecond update, maybe he moves 100 pixels, right? So in this framework now, you are calculating how much game time, how much real world time has elapsed and telling the game world to update by that amount. So what happens is what you get in the end is a game that runs at a fixed game engine update speed, but a variable frames per second. See how that works? So sometimes you may render 10 frames per second. Sometimes you may render a thousand frames per second, but your game is still going to look like it is moving along at the same speed, no matter how many frames per second have been calculated. Now, sometimes this is what you want. Sometimes this is really not what you want, right? Because on some frames, Mario may be moving super smooth at a thousand frames per second, moving very small amounts, but then you get a couple of frames where Mario jumps forward by a bunch, right? So I have played games where they do this um, and it can be really good or it can be really bad. So each frame, we're going to calculate how much real time, like actual universe computation time has passed since the last game update. And when we update the game state, we use the real elapsed time as a scaling variable. So for example, if we have a bullet flying through the air, each time step, you update it with the velocity, right? That's what we were doing before. So it just moves eight pixels per frame. But with a variable time scale, you are going to scale the velocity with the elapsed time. So you're just going to multiply how fast it goes by the amount of time that um, the real world took to calculate that. So what are the advantages to the variable time step? Well, the games are going to complain. The, the game is going to play at a consistent rate on different hardware. Right? So that means that Mario is going to ideally be moving around at the same speed on different hardware and you don't have to put in these arbitrary frame per second limit. Players with faster machines get smoother frames per second. They don't need to lock in a frames per second, right? They just, it just runs as fast as it can possibly run. And on older machines, it's going to run at a lower frame per second, but at least Mario is moving around at the same speed. Here's the disadvantages though. You are going to get non-deterministic effects based on variable FPS. So now this may happen, it may not happen, but floating point rounding errors may also occur, right? You could have network desynchronization if you're playing on two different speed hardwares and they're not locked FPS, it's going to be very difficult to keep uh, that uh, frame, um, the network updates synchronized. And your physics simulations may actually yield different results. What do I mean by that? 
Well, let's have a look here. Let's say that elapsed. Let's say that we want to do two updates of five milliseconds versus one update of 10 milliseconds, okay? When you do things like floating point division, weird things can happen. Like for example, oh, I have a good example. Let's say one of our um, times was one millisecond and the other one was five milliseconds. So that, that's a good example because five is a prime number and it's one divided by five is 0 0.2. 0 0.2 cannot be represented exactly by a floating point. It can't. That's a hilarious problem that modern computers have, is that you cannot represent 0 0.2 exactly. With floating point, with double precision, it is not a sum of powers of two. It can't be represented. So what that means is, one, in one way, Maybe you have to do five times as many updates, but you're not that elapsed, right? If you pass in 0 0.2 versus one, so one of them, the less frequent one, let's say it's one second that gets passed in. The five updates one is going to be 0 0.2. Well, that 0 0.2 is actually gonna be like 0 0.200001. And so you're literally passing in different amounts of time for each update. And depending on that, like 0 0.001, that could be the difference between, I don't know, a, like Mario's toe being right on the edge of something versus falling off of something. Or it could be that a physics simulator has something roll to the left instead of roll to the right. And so it can produce different results based on the hardware. So even though I said that, you know, Mario will be moving around at the same speed, if you do pass in these fractions of seconds and you're now multiplying things by floating point numbers, floating point rounding and floating point calculations like this are, are going to cause an issue eventually. Not to mention all the other things like variable frame rates and, and network desynchronization, etc. So keep in mind that even though this seems like it solves a bunch of problems, it also introduces other problems. So just, just keep that in mind. Don't switch your game engine to this. I'm just, I'm just teaching you about it. So how does rendering fit in all of this? Whether or not we use variable time steps, our rendering is not affected, right? Because here in our, in our thing here, we're, got, we're still doing one render per update. It's just that we are varying the amount of time that passes for each update. Rendering essentially just takes the current state of the game and draws it. That's all it ever does. It looks at your current entities and draws them to the screen. So instead of variably updating the game simulation, let's render at variable times, okay? So this lets us go back to fixed game steps. So this is what's going to happen this time. Instead of variably updating the game, we're going to vary the number of times we discreetly update the game. So what's gonna happen is we're going to process some input and then we are going to decide how many times we want to update the game engine before we actually do the rendering. So here's my real world analogy, which is kind of funny. Um, at least as I think it's funny, but it also kind of fits. You are tasked to make one cheeseburger per minute at a fast food place. I don't know if that's slow or, or fast by modern cheeseburger place standards, but let's say that's what your boss has done. Your job all day is to make one cheeseburger a minute and put it on this tray, right? Put it on the tray, put it on the tray, put it on the tray. So, cause they've discovered that our customers are going to consume one cheeseburger per minute. But the cool thing is you're so good at your job that it only takes you about 15 seconds to make a cheeseburger, right? So you have 45 seconds to rest every minute. So this is the analogy. One cheeseburger per minute is 60 seconds per frame, okay? It's just like a real world analogy that's going to make our algorithm make some sense.
So it only takes you 15, 15 seconds to make a cheeseburger. So you have all of this rest time in between, in between. So that is our sleep, right? We can sleep for 45 seconds every minute at our fast food job. But what happens is throughout the day, maybe there's a bunch of customers, you get distracted. One burger slips and falls and it takes you two minutes to clean it up. Now you're behind by two cheeseburgers, right? So what do you do? Do you just keep on going, making one cheeseburger per minute? No, you can actually catch up because you can make four burgers per minute. So on the next minute, since there won't be an accident, or maybe there will be, but probably won't be, you could actually make three total cheeseburgers in that minute to keep up. Okay, so the making of the cheeseburgers is the game engine update and the placing of the cheeseburgers on the tray is your actual rendering. So here's the burger analogy. Your desired is one burger per minute, right? So this is your day. Um, you got 60 seconds to make a burger. You take the burger, you make the burger. 60 seconds between each one. But you've got 15 seconds that's how long it takes you to make a burger, right? Sometimes it's gonna be 15, sometimes it's gonna be 14, but typically you can make a burger in, in 15 seconds. So you've got all this time here that you're not really doing anything, right? So at some point, let's say you've made one burger and you've waited, but then there's a two minute accident and you've skipped making two burgers. So what do you do? Well, I can make a burger every 15 seconds, so in the next minute, I'm gonna make three burgers, right? So that is exactly what, the, I hope that's not too stupid of an analogy, but if we lock in this every minute as our frames per second, this is what this algorithm is going to do. So what we've got, so we've got some previous time step that we're going to record, and we've got an amount of lag that we're recording. And the lag is sort of, it's that two minutes right? So the lag is, oh crap, I had a two minute accident, right? So we've got our current time for this frame and our elapsed time is going to be the current time minus the previous time. All right. Then we set previous into current. So we are always looking at our previous time minus the current time to figure out how much time the last render took. So that is how much time did it take me to make the last burger or did I make the burger within the minute? Then what I'm going to say is that my lag, I'm going to add the elapsed time, right? Then I process my inputs and I say, while lag is greater than the milliseconds per update, do an update. So this says while, so back here in this analogy, I would add two minutes to the lag, right? And now I'm gonna make a burger and I'm going to subtract how many burgers per second I was supposed to have made. And that's all it is. So while I have to catch up, I keep doing updates. There you go. That, that's what this algorithm does. So what does it do? So lag measures how far behind the game's clock is behind the real world clock, right? So for example, if one update or render took too long, then we are behind by a specific amount. That inner loop is going to update the game to catch up until all the lag is gone with fixed step updates. That's the important part here. They are no longer variable step updates. They are fixed step updates that are going to produce the same results every time, no matter what. Once we catch up, we render the scene. And so the game simulates at a constant rate using fixed time steps in a safe way to catch up for lag frames. Now, the rendering may appear choppy for a frame or two while the game catches up, but at least the simulation speed is fixed on different hardware, right? So what does this mean? It means that to you, there may be a lag frame, but overall, Mario is still gonna be running at the same speed because you're able to catch up like this. But keep in mind that we can only catch up if these lag frames are infrequent, right? So for example, if the update is the problem, then 
you may actually be causing more lag here by trying to do multiple updates. But this is our only option, right? We are going to hope that the update function is fast enough that I can keep doing them in between renderings to catch up from that lag, right? So for example, if somehow I like broke my arm and it now takes me two minutes to make a burger, then I'm never gonna catch up, right? I'm just making two minute burgers forever and the manager's getting really mad at me. So that can still happen, right? But hopefully that doesn't happen and you're a 15 second burger maker so you can make a bunch of burgers to catch up. All right. So what we've done here is something that's very important. We have decoupled rendering from the game simulation. So we've removed the synchronization of rendering from update. And we're no longer necessarily calling one render per update. That means if we wanted to, we could put rendering into another thread or we could put the game engine update into another thread. We no longer have to go in lockstep. Right? But some issues can arise from this, obviously. Um, maybe now when we call a render, if they're in different threads, maybe we're trying to render while the game state is updating. And so like we have this thing where maybe we're going um, update, update, render, update, render, update. It's in like a weird order. So we are not getting into multi-threading stuff in this course. We would take a whole course to debug our multi-threading. So we're going to keep it single-threaded for this course, but just realize that this can go really deep, right? So if we render between updates, the game world could be the same for two frames, which could look choppy or bad. So for example here, if we had two renders per update because of like a lag frame in the update, that might look bad to the user, who knows? Um, we can kind of do a hybrid of the two techniques where we interpolate or do basic mo movement calculations inside the rendering engine. So what what this means is that some modern game engines actually have two simulations going on. One is the simulation of like everything in the game. Let me go back to my rendering here. So what they could do if this was multi-threaded is that the update, this update is like all the physics, all the game world stuff, but they may also just have an update function which say predicts where the user is supposed to be in the game world. So what this means is that if there is lag in the game world update, you could update, oh, sorry, I'm just, I'm just hopping between slides here. You could just like update where you think the character is supposed to be. And then while you're rendering, at least the character is moving, but the physics aren't yet caught up on the update. So there's all sorts of crazy stuff you can do with multiple game tick updates, different game tick updates. Oh, it's, it's crazy what modern engines are doing. And so if you do this, some sort of interpolation or basic movement calculation to, to try and alleviate the um, problem of lag in updates, then the physics might, might not be exact, but at some point in the game world, um, it is going to be exact. Now, this is actually what happens in most modern multiplayer games that are over a network, right? You've probably seen that before where you're playing a network game and you're moving along at like a smooth speed through the game world. And then all of a sudden you get like rewinded or something like that. And that's because there was some lag behind the scenes, but there's two things going on. You are sending commands to the server the server is doing the real trusted update of where you should be based on those commands, but your client is not waiting for the server's response to update your actual game position. So back in the day, um, I'll just remove this. Back in the day, what used to happen, actually, let me just draw this out because I think it's pretty interesting. You've got like the server over here and you've got the client over here, right? So back in the day when I used to play uh, Quake and Doom, like, like uh, yes, I'm so old, I used to play Doom over uh, over direct modem. So, you know, you. I don't know how many of you ever used a modem that used your phone line, but like I would have to like start a server on my machine, then my friend would have to call me via his modem, and then we would start playing, and then his mom would pick up the phone and we'd get disconnected. So that's just how old I am. All right. <laughs> 
So you've got the client here. And what used to happen is that the client would send, I want to move up to the server. And then the server would say, okay, I have processed moving up. Here is the new game state. I am sending it back to you. And then you'd send the command, you'd wait for it to come back, and only then would you render. So if you had like a 500 millisecond ping, which I did back in the day over a modem, um, you would hold up and you wouldn't move on your screen for half a second, right? So that's kind of crazy. But modern game engines, what they do is they have two sorts of calculations. One, if I can get my laser pointer, is what, would, what happens now is your client sends, I want to move up to the server, and your client starts moving up, right? It just, it, it starts immediately moving in the direction that you told the server that you wanted to move. So it's doing a prediction so that you don't actually have a half a second lag in when you try and update. Then the server, once it figures out where you should be, is going to send it back to you. And then if there's any difference, it's going to fix your position. If there's no difference, then it looks like there was no lag at all, right? So this is a gross simplification, of course, but it's sort of the difference in how multiplayer networking has evolved over the years. Is that like this prediction, predictive moving by the client is actually like, okay, when I pulled the trigger in the client, my crosshairs were, were on the guy's head. So should like in CSGO, for example, if in my client, if I think I should get a headshot, should I get a headshot or should it only count if the server thought I should get a headshot, right? So there's all sorts of like trusting the client versus trusting the server issues there. But I digress. This is not a networking class, but I did want to just mention that. Oops. All right. So let me just discard those annotations and then we'll get back. A separate issue that you may face, and this is related to what we've been doing, but this is kind of a separate issue is game speed and how that relates to collisions. So for example, given our basic way of doing collision detection, an entity that's going fast enough could pass through a game tile or a bullet, etc. So we sort of did a janky way of fixing this in assignment three by setting a maximum speed for the entities. So what I was doing there by setting a maximum speed was helping you in a way that maybe you didn't um, understand yet. So as long as the maximum speed of the player is less than the thickness of the smallest tile, then this works, right? But what if we want to allow our entities in the game to go at speeds that are faster than this? And we may want that. What we can do is do multiple update loops. Now I'll give you a, a diagram of this in a second that'll make it all clear. But one simple solution is to increase the number of game ticks per second. For example, let's say that uh, we want our player to be able to travel at 100 pixels per frame, but our tile size is fixed at 32 pixels wide. And so, if I travel at 100 pixels per frame, I could go through a tile without ever realizing it. So instead, what we can do is we can fix the player speed to 25 pixels per frame, but do four game world updates before rendering it. And so we're trading CPU effort for simulation accuracy. So watch this. Let's say this is one render. Right? So this is one render, each of these lines. So if I'm going, let's say this over here is 32 pixels wide. I don't know, I'm just making up some values. But let's say I'm going 100 pixels per frame, right? So this is update, render, update, render, update, render, what we're currently doing in our, in our game engine. So I'm gonna go 100 pixels, then render, 100 pixels, then render, 100 pixels, then render, 100 pixels, then render. Mario ran straight through this pipe right? Uh, I couldn't detect that collision because on one frame, he was right here and on another frame, he was right here. So what I can do is instead of allowing Mario to move at a hundred frames per second or a hundred pixels per 
per update, I'm going to make Mario move 25 pixels per update and just do four updates between each render. So now I've got update, 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 render, update, 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 render, again, and then, oh, now I'm detecting the collision properly. So what games actually do is that their tick rate, right? So they call this a tick rate, how many times they update the game engine, that is happening at a different rate than the rendering, okay? So you can make Mario run what looks like 100 pixels per frame, but that's 100 pixels per render frame because you've done a bunch of updates to keep the, um, the precision going. Um, what I do want to show, uh, I don't like playing... You know what? I, I really don't like playing um, other people's YouTube videos since I'm streaming on YouTube. I don't want to like freeboot those videos. But please um, go watch these videos. Okay, so take a screen. I'll give you like 10 seconds. Take a screenshot. Uh, this will be on the slides for the students in the class. But watch these two first videos. So this lecture has only been 50 minutes, right? We have an hour and 20 minutes per lecture. Please go watch this video, Coins Falling Through Floor, and Walls, Floors, and Ceilings. This explains a bunch of the physics. Actually, watch this one first, and then watch this one. And it shows you exactly how things are done in Mario 64, and it will show you that this is what they do. So there are actually four, there are four game tick updates per render frame in Mario 64. And if you really want your mind blown, uh, go watch this video by the same person um, which talks about parallel universes in Mario 64. It's a bit of a meme, but it's it's awesome. So that's it for today's lecture. Please go watch those videos. Um, we don't have an exam, but I promise you that you will enjoy having watched those videos, I think. Um, keep in mind that today, as of the recording this lecture, this is Tuesday, um, Thursday is following Friday's schedule because of Remembrance Day. So there is no official lecture on, um, on, a, on, on Thursday. So that's it. So you get a day off this week. Um, we have no assignments remaining in the course. So please work on assignment four, work on your projects. I told people that I was going to review the project proposals last night. What I'm going to do is review the project proposals like right now as of the recording of this. So I'm going to turn off the stream. I'm going to update the spreadsheet with the link to this um, video. Then I'm going to go read the project proposals. So if you're watching this um, in, a, in a video, so if it's not live, then your project proposals have been marked if you have submitted them as of this time. All right, thank you so much. Um, we are getting into some really cool stuff once, oh, uh, next week's lectures, these are two of my favorites. You gotta, gotta tune in for these two lectures. I'm really excited about those. Every year, I absolutely love these, these two things. Um, so, uh, that's it for today and I'll see you in the next one.